Now let's take a look at the Eastern Front of fighting in World War I. We've already discussed the Western Front and the Schlieffen Plan, which was when Germany planned to attack France quickly and have a victory, and then, their tran tra uh, then to transfer their forces east towards Russia. We already discussed the reasons why this failed, the fact that the Russians mobilized more quickly, they did not defeat France quickly, and so therefore the Germans had to face their nightmare, which was to be fighting on two fronts at the same time. However, as you'll see, the Eastern Front definitely proved to be more victorious for the Germans than the Western Front. The Russians were pretty successful at defeating the Austrians. However, time and again, they failed to be able to have decisive victories over the Germans. In fact, just in September of that first year of fighting, 1914, the Germans defeated the Russians at Tannenberg and at Mossrian Lakes. This was a pattern, like I said, that was going to be repeated many times. The Russians were able to have victories against the Austrians, who we already know did not have that formidable of a fighting force, but they couldn't seem to defeat the Germans. The Germans did, however, um, have to keep bailing out the Austro-Hungarian forces. But the results of these defeats that the Germans had over the Russians were that it boosted Germans' confidence, it forced Russia out of Germany, and if you look at the map at the top of page 45, you can see where the borders of Germany and Russia were at this point. So these German defeats on Russia did force the Russians out of Germany, and it made Russia lose a lot in terms of manpower, equipment, and ammunition. And then when Turkey entered the war on the side of Germany, Turkey could do some severe damage as far as blockading Russian ports on the Black Sea and prevent them from getting necessary supplies and food for their troops. Those ports on the Black Sea that Russia accessed needed to be first accessed through the Straits of the Dardanelles, which was through the Mediterranean Sea into the Black Sea. The Turkish forces quickly cut off the Dardanelle Straits, which resulted in that blockade of Russian ports on the Black Sea. This severely hurt Russia's position and ability to continue fighting the Germans. Now let's take a year-by-year -year approach similar to how we discussed the Western Front. In 1915, a combined German Austro combined Austro-German offensive meant that Russia lost all of its previous gains that it had taken in 1914. And by the end of the year of 1915, the Russians had withdrawn a huge amount of distance, and you can see that they lost over a million dead and a further million were taken prisoners. It's pretty hard to imagine that amount of casualties. In the United States, the highest casualty toll that we've ever had was in the Civil War, and it was around 600,000. But you can see here, not just in 1915, but also in ensuing years, that the Russians lost up to a million men in different offensives. Take a look at a Russian general's report to the Tsar at the bottom of page 45. And his report basically said that a third of the men had no rifles. These poor devils have to wait patiently until their comrades fall so they can pick up their weapons. The army is drowning in its own blood. That right there shows you the conditions that the Russian forces were having to face against the German troops. So therefore, the Russians had to set up a new line of defense. And you can see on the map where it extended from. From the Baltic Sea down to the Black Sea, and it was known as the Eastern Front. It was a much greater distance than the Western Front was. It became known as 600 miles of mud and horror because of the trench fighting and other conditions that soldiers faced on the Western Front. It seems like by the end of 1915, the Russians would have a lot of reasons to simply give up because they were definitely being rolled over by the German forces, even though they had had some success against the Austrian forces. However, in 1916, the Russians saw their greatest successes of the war, and a lot of that was due to the determination of the home front, the civilians of Russia joining together to produce more amounts of supplies and food for their troops. This renewed determination encouraged the Russians to launch a major offensive in June of 1916, which was known as the Brusilov Offensive. At first, this offensive was pretty successful, and the Russians were able to make a large advance, up to 160 kilometers. But with the German forces coming at them again to support the Austrians, the Brusilov Offensive had to stop, and it cost the Russians a million lives once again. So you can see the amount of casualty tolls the Russians had to suffer. It was huge. 
This offensive in 1916 also caused huge casualties for the Austrians. However, the results of this offensive was seen most in Russia. The morale of the Russian people was severely damaged. The civilians had spent so much time and effort in trying to supply their troops with more supplies and food, yet they were completely torn apart in this offensive in the end. Many people in Russia began to become very upset with their government. The ruling Romanov dynasty was in power, and there was a lot of mounting pressure within the country that finally exploded in February of 1917, which was when the Tsar was forced to abdicate the throne and signaled the beginning of the Russian Revolution. A provisional government was established, and they decided to continue the war effort. However, the Bolshevik Party, which had initiated the Russian Revolution, was able to overthrow this provisional government and remove Russia from the war effort altogether. They signed a separate peace treaty with Germany. So basically, they bailed out of World War I at this point and left the rest of the Allies hanging. Eventually, this new Bolshevik government would then establish the Soviet Union. So the years of 1916 and 1917 were pretty much a mixed bag for Russia. They had at first that renewed determination, success, but followed by huge losses and casualties, and eventually their own country coming apart with a revolution in 1917. When the Russians left the war, that removed Germany's need to fight on two fronts, which allowed Germany to completely focus on the Western Front. Fortunately for the Allied troops, the United States had also entered at this point, giving the Allies a chance and a hope of winning against the Germans. So as we've seen, the Eastern Front was definitely more of a success for the German forces. The Russians put up a great resistance, but in the end, they had to withdraw from the entire war, which only helped the Germans. However, Russian forces did help to expedite the withdrawal of the Austro-Hungarian forces, along with troops from several other diversionary fronts, as you can see on the screen here. The two main fronts of fighting were definitely the Western and the Eastern fronts. However, because of the amount of countries involved, there were several other smaller fronts, which were more diversionary in nature, but did help to assist in bringing down the Central Powers in the end. Let's start with the Balkan Front. We definitely know that Serbia was on the side of the Allies from back in the Bosnian crisis and leading up to the assassination of the Archduke. However, once the war began, Austria-Hungary failed to occupy Serbia in 1914. Yet, when Bulgaria entered this, the war on the side of the Central Powers, they were able to join with the Austrian and German troops in an offensive on Serbia. The reasons why Bulgaria entered on the side of the Central Powers is a little complex, but it goes back to the Bulgarian crisis of the 1870s. They had felt manipulated by several European powers, but primarily the Russians. This made them naturally want to draw closer to the countries of Germany and Austria-Hungary, even though they too were European. The Bulgarians saw them as more in line with what they wanted in the end. So their troops, because they lay directly on the border with Serbia, were efficient in helping the Austrian and German troops launch offensive in this area of the Balkans. In August of 1916, the country of Romania, which also sits in the Balkans, joined the war effort on the side of the Allies. That was the same year the Russians had that renewed sense of hope and determination because of their home front contributions, and some of their successes that year encouraged Romania to join with the war effort. However, we also know from our discussion of the Eastern Front that Russia had some severe losses that year too, and Romania itself was quickly overrun by the forces of the Central Powers. Finally, the Allies were successful in defeating Bulgaria in 1918, which was pretty much the beginning of the end for most of the Central Powers, with the exception of Germany. Shortly after Bulgaria's defeat, Austria-Hungary would follow, and then Turkey, and then finally Germany. Let's look at another diversionary front opened up by the Italians. Now we know from before the Triple Alliance included Italy, but they were seen as an unreliable ally at best by the Germans. And in fact, when the Balkan crises uh, were going on, followed by the assassination in the July crisis of 1914, the Italians pretty much kept to themselves and did not 
assist Germany and Austria-Hungary with what they were trying to do. But in 1915, they decided to join the war on the side of the Allies, not the Central Powers. And the main reason for this is because the British promised the Italians some territory that they had wanted. The significance of the Italians entering the war was that they were able to open up a front between Italy and Austria. However, the fighting of this front was extremely difficult because of the mountainous terrain of the Alps. And once again, just like we discussed in the Western Front, stalemated, stalemates resulted. Not necessarily so much for trench fighting, but because of the difficult terrain. The Italian forces had very limited success against the Central Powers, especially with the Battle of Caporetto, in which they were forced to retreat over 110 kilometers. Um, yet this Italian front did place a pretty big burden on the Austro-Hungarian forces because they had to ship a lot of their troops to meet the Italians. So it served more to assist the British and French on the Western Front because more troops from the Central Powers were being drawn away from there. Now let's address what happened with Turkey and some of the other countries in the Middle East in that diversionary front. Turkey joined Germany and Austria-Hungary on October 31st of 1914 and their main goal was to stop Russian expansion on the Black Sea. Now as we know Turkey was the the primary seat of the failing Ottoman Empire and the, they were the strongest part of that empire that were that remained at, up to this point. The Allied forces attacked the Turkish Empire in three different campaigns. You can find the details of these campaigns at the bottom of 47 and 48. But basically, the first campaign was launched at Gallipoli. And if you look back at the map at the top of 45, you can see where this is. It is on the extreme western side of the Turkish Empire, pretty much at the Dardanelles Straits at the entrance to the Black Sea. What they were trying to do in this campaign was for the British warships to sweep through the Dardanelles, attack the capital of Constantinople, and therefore drive Turkey out of the war. In doing so, they would be able to relieve the pressure that was being put on Russia with that blockade that I had mentioned with the Eastern Front. However, these plans did not play out the way that they had hoped. The first stage of the campaign was a pretty much failure for the Allied forces because the Turkish troops were able to protect the Straits of the Dardanelles and were able to damage British and French ships pretty significantly. So therefore, the British and French troops had to regroup and launch a land invasion to try to capture the Gallipoli Peninsula of Turkey. Instead of using their own forces, which were tied up in the Western Front, a large number of Australians and New Zealanders, which were colonies of Great Britain, were the ones who led the fighting in this particular campaign, which took place in April of 1915. These soldiers put up a good fight but they did suffer from shortages, delays, and tactical errors. Um, the main armies of Britain and France were tied up, like I said, in the Western Front, so there was a limit to how much these troops could do. They finally abandoned in November, not achieving any of their goals of taking over Gallipoli and opening up the Straits to relieve the Russians, and the Allies did suffer a huge loss of life, 250,000 dead or captured. The second campaign against Turkey by the Allies was much more successful. In the end, the Allies were able to win control of oil through Mesopotamia and put the British forces in control. Mesopotamia was that area of the Middle East, which is now modern-day countries of Iraq and so forth. The British being in control of these areas, and specifically cities like Basra, Baghdad, and Mosul, um, secured British and Allied presence in the Middle East for years to come. Finally, in the third campaign that was launched by the Allied troops, um, Turkish troops were attacked and forced out of the areas east that they were occupying back through Palestine and towards their home country of Turkey itself. The British were aided in this campaign by many Arab troops who were promised independence. This is really important, and I encourage you to take time to read this paragraph on the top of page 48. This sets up a lot of the issues involving the Arab-Israeli conflicts that were to come after World War II. These promises made by the British to different groups, the Arabs for one, because of this campaign, but also Jews were being promised their homeland by the British in the Balfour Declaration, which we'll discuss at a later point. 
but this particular campaign right here is definitely the source for many areas.